Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have Morpheus, developed by Andrew Braybrook and published in 1987 by Rainbird Software, Telecom Soft. It was produced by Graft Gold Limited. The graphics were by Andrew Braybrook and the music and sound effects were composed by Steve Turner. It was obviously coded by Andrew Braybrook. I'm going to be looking at the tape and disc version of this game today. So one of the things that inspired me to buy the tape version of this game back in the day was when I was reading the diary of the game development. I think it was in Zap 64, I think the the title of the diary series, which was about eight parts, I think. It was called Mental Appropriation, I think. And I greatly enjoyed reading about uh, Andrew Braybrook's challenges and insight into writing his game in this series. It was greatly helpful to me as a young budding programmer, if you like, to learn about the challenges of games development from other people in these kind of like diaries. Anyway, it inspired me to buy the copy of the game, which I think was probably the point in publishing a diary in the first place. One of the things that I want to have a look at with this game is that the instruction manual says that the high score is saved to disk. Now, I had the original tape version back in the day, and I didn't notice when I actually got my disk drive that it was trying to access the disk when the tape version was running. So I have a feeling that the disk high score saving was only probably implemented in the disc version of the game. So I'm going to be looking at both versions of the game today. I want to see what the differences are between the disc and the tape version. Morpheus is one of those games where you definitely benefit from reading the instruction manual because it's very enjoyable and I greatly enjoy playing this game, but there are some technical details which make the game a lot easier to understand if you read the instruction manual. For example, how the funds tra can transfer between games. Unspent funds, that is. So with this tape version, I saw this very quick turbo load starting. I actually quite liked the aesthetic, the color choices here for the turbo load and the way that the border, uh, the, the way that the screen displayed and the border colors update with its specific pattern is actually quite unique. I think Andrew Braybrook uh, coded this tape loader as well. What I liked about this as well was that very early on during the loading process the bitmap display starts bringing in these extra falling graphics. Now these graphics are parts of the level that you have to drain of energy or destroy to get the the little nexus thing in the middle of the of the level to to die or whatever it is exhaust its charge and then you complete the level so they fall in and then they're obviously time to fall in and complete falling in just in time for the load to complete and then we're greeted by this actually quite lovely title screen and a track sequence I loved the music on this. I think it fitted the game really well. It has this kind of like nice, mellow, almost disco-ish kind of feel to it, which sets the tone for the game. It's like the relaxing tone before you actually get into the game itself. And, and the game feels a little bit like you're being asked to do some work. I mean, you are. You're being asked to drain the energy from these things which are orbiting the nexus thing or whatever it is. The nucleus, sorry, not the nexus, the nucleus, yes. And you have to do this to progress through the levels and also earn in-game money. So hence, you know, the, the, having to do the work Anyway, so the, the game instructions actually come with these nice, 
colourful indications about the, uh, the the systems, the the weapons that you can actually buy for your ship with the in-game money that you earn. Now, what I really liked but also slightly disliked was that during the game it doesn't display these very detailed screens. These very detailed screens, I think they were designed on an Amiga or an ST or something like that which had better graphics capabilities because the Commodore 64 wouldn't be able to display screens that were quite as high resolution and quite as colourful as that. But it would have been nice if the game displayed something like those screens so that you didn't need to keep on looking in the instruction manual all the time to, to remind yourself. Anyway, so once you learn about the ship's systems and weapons that you can actually buy and how to expand the ship, it becomes somewhat second nature, so you don't need to refer to the instruction manual so much. So this launch sequence, I was really quite inspired to try and do similar effects with that parallax effect with the grid in the background launching you off into space. There is the nucleus, not the nexus, the nucleus and it's very angry and it fires at you. So you have to drain the energy from these little things orbiting the nucleus. Actually, they're not so little. They're quite large, relatively speaking. Especially large to your first spaceship that you have. Now I'm having a little play through the game here just so that everyone can see what is involved in playing the game because it was one of those games which is not obvious. Now I've drained the energy from the thing orbiting the, the nucleus and the nucleus has signalled that it is going to destroy itself or die or whatever it is it's going to do, end the level effectively. But you have to get down to it quick enough so that you can, there we go, destroy the things which come out of it because it gives you some extra bonus points, extra bonus money if you destroy those things that come out at the end of the level and then you dematerialize and then you come back to the ship launching thing and then you can go back to this menu and it says here look I've got 2904 in-game currency. Now the replacement ship hulls they get bigger and bigger and obviously more and more expensive. I actually liked using the large ship the largest ship actually was it, it was very large but you could fill it full of nice useful things like energy generation and shields and then you were uh, uh, a lot safer. Unit BA1 for example which costs 5000 G is a, uh, a battery. It's not part of the shield system, it's part of the energy acquisition system so the battery stores energy that's being generated and then returns it back to the spaceship when it's needed. Very useful. It would have been really great if these screens were in the C64 version. They could have uh, animated or something and, and given you more context about what everything does. But anyway, this is uh, an IC4, which I think is uh, an inertial charge converter or something like that. The faster you move your spaceship, the more energy you are generating. Anyway, it costs 5000 G and I only have 2904 G, so obviously I don't have enough money. Interestingly, this game would also use the extra processor speed available in the C128 compared to the C64, as it says in the instruction manual. Anyway, we can see here in the middle of page 34 of the instruction manual, the inertia converter ID code IC basically converts the inertia, the speed of the spaceship into energy. Anyway, here we go off into the next level. The next level you need to destroy two of the things orbiting the nucleus rather than just one. When I was playing the game, I, I remember I used to find it easier to line up either horizontally or vertically with the nucleus and then usually destroy the last orbiting thing 
so that it was lined up with the nucleus so I could quickly and efficiently get back to the nucleus without getting lost in the middle of space. Sometimes these things that come out when you are draining the energy are quite aggressive, so you need to be careful. They get quite aggressive as well when they're hurt but not destroyed. There is the nucleus signaling it is quite angry again. Now the little red flashing thing on my spaceship and the corresponding sound effect indicates that my energy is low. Okay, I have some extra bonus points there. I think I was lucky that my ship did not get destroyed there. I still can't afford a larger ship hull, but what I can do is that I can afford one of these. I don't have anything which is ready to be installed yet. I also love the, the green kind of like launchy thing off on the left hand side. A very large sprite if I remember correctly. So there is this lovely uh, parallax star field in the background, which if I remember correctly is just using characters. Then the rest of the actual game display, apart from the score up in the top obviously, the star field goes uh, behind the score panel, it, which is not a separate panel as is usually used in Commodore 64 games. This is actually just a a character score panel which is not separate to the main game area. You'll see that the sprites for the game are displayed over the score panel. There, there's no usual kind of like horizontal bar of blackness. Uh, and that's because the, the game actually doesn't have really any character graphics for the for the level itself I don't think, it's just got the star field and the score panel. The rest of the game graphics are all sprites, I think, practically. Oh, apart from the spaceship of course, your your main ship is not sprites, your main ship is uh, other characters, <laughs> of course. So that's what's unusual about this game as well, is that the the, the player controlled ship is actually a very large just you know character map so the rest of the screen does not scroll obviously apart from the, the apart from the characters being used for the parallax starfield but the parallax starfield is you know just updated just uh, dynamically updated characters sometimes or, or it might be using different characters we'll have to check that later on but I would hazard a guess that it is probably updating uh, a couple of character cells with uh, redefined graphics to scroll with pixel accuracy and then the characters are moved with character cell accuracy. But basically the, the hardware scroll, pixel scroll registers in the VIC are not being used because obviously those would affect the spaceship and your your player controlled ship and and so there isn't really any hardware pixel level scrolling going on in this part of the game. So I'm not controlling this ship terribly well, am I really? Uh, I'm playing on keyboard in the emulator. while I'm choosing here to mow down 
I'm not actually choosing to do that. I'm controlling the ship very, very badly. My energy is running out. I'm very low on energy. I'm quite scared. If you don't visit the nucleus, uh, then it will still collapse the level. Ow. Ow. You can choose to dematerialize early actually by moving the ship control cursor to the rear engine and then holding down fire. There we go. I have installed my new system, which is the inertia converter that we can see on the instructions on the left hand side. I still cannot really afford a new spaceship hull yet, so I've only got one slot which is, I'm going to put the inertia converter there so that I can actually recharge the ship's energy. You can see that the energy on the spaceship actually now is zooming around very nice and quickly. Which is great, it means that I have tons of energy. If I get shot you can see it slows down. And then I need to move around quickly to actually... Ooh. Well, now it won't recharge because the, the enemy has just shot <sighs> that upgrade that I just bought and installed. See, there's a hole in my spaceship, it just got destroyed. Okay, great. Well. Let's show what, show what happens when, when your ship gets destroyed. There we go. Um, a nice little pulsing, fading, colour cycling effect. Now, I'm. this is the tape version, but I'm watching the disc interface here. I'm going to attach a new disc image. Even though I'm using the tape version, I'm, I'm attaching a disk image now. True Drive emulation is turned on in the emulator, which means that it has effectively a real drive being emulated there with all of the code and everything. So I have updated. Well, I'm going to enter some characters. So we have some sprites there. Lots and lots of, I think, multiplex sprites, maybe. There is no disk code, no disk update at all being visible during the score panel, uh, score save, score table save on the tape version. So let's have a look at the disk version now. I'm going to have a look at the disk using my tweaked version of C1541. Oh, look. This looks like it's using GMA88, which is a, a variation on the GMA87 protection scheme. We can see that the disc actually has 42 tracks as opposed to 35. So we can see GMA88 is documented here on this website. You can see what the link is in the address bar. A few games released in 1988, I'm guessing, use GMA88, which basically is like GMA 87, 86 and 85. One of my previous videos, the uh, disk loader archaeology video, I think it was, was looking at how many games used the fast loader, which was, which came, I think, bundled with this protection scheme. And there were hundreds of games. One of my other videos also goes into doing a technical deep dive into exactly how this protection scheme works, but basically 
it counts the length of a few sync markers on a, on the particular protection track and the particular protection track is beyond track 35 I think it was usually track 38 so using my tweaked version of C1541 I can actually show the raw GCR data and the protection code looks for a particular sequence of raw G, uh, raw bytes not it doesn't have to be GCR data actually it's just raw data coming from the disk so there is other data in the other tracks as well that we can see here but it mostly seems to be blank 55 five is basically alternating on off bits or rather off on bits yes in a repeating pattern for the whole byte this repeating bit pattern on the disk is basically used as kind of like a, an empty space or fill on marker or something like that. It doesn't contain data, basically. The, the raw data that's on the disk does not have to use GCR encoding, of course. You can use, if you wanted to, whatever encoding scheme you like, as long as it falls within the constraints of the drive head and the circuitry being able to reliably read the bits on the disk and send it back to you for decoding later on. You can use whatever encoding methodology you like. There are certain constraints in that the drive head cannot read more than a certain number of bits at the same value and that's the only thing I think that you have to really worry about. Oh, the, the, the speed of the bits on, on the disk as well, the, the, how closely they're packed as well of course. But, Anyway, so because it's using uh, GMA88, we already know how practically how the game data is going to get into the Commodore 64's memory. So I'm not going to go too, into too much detail at the moment about the technical intricacies of how the game on disk boots and how the protection check works because I've already gone through that in a previous video and I'll add a link to that video in the description below. Here I'm just using my other favourite tool which, is, which enables the G64 file to be dumped to a text file so that it is, it is humanly readable. The G64 conf tool which is really quite an excellent little addition to being able to debug this kind of stuff. It shows you raw bytes and also it tries to use GCR decoding on, on the raw bytes on the disk and then it shows you that data as well if the decoded information corresponds to valid track and sector headers then it shows you that too in a nice readable format which is really quite cool. So the pattern it looks for in the protection track is 69 followed by 3 bytes which we don't care about followed by an A9 and it should only occur once per track so it's not that one because it's A7 it's it looks like this one and the reason why it looks like this one is because we it matches the pattern but we can also see that there are quite a lot of sinks followed by raw bytes and it's the time between those sinks which is important or rather the length so it's loading some data way up in memory, which I think is just the, the loading screen. And then it uses the standard kind of like fast load to let, then load the rest of the game code, which is a very long file that we can see going through the whole of memory practically apart from the end of memory. Now during this, we can see that the, the Border color is rapidly changing and there is also a sound effect going along with it too. We can see here obviously an increment border instruction, INC D D020, which is increment border, and D418 increment, which is uh, incrementing the sound, the SID chips volume register. But if we scroll up through the code, well, we can see here, first of all, it's doing a restoration of 01, which is the processor port. But scrolling up, we'll be able to see very quickly that it's doing an EOR with whatever value is in X, the X register, 
at 6e6 in hex, which is doing a TXA, it basically restores what was in, in the um, X register. The X register is basically the the descramble code which is coming which came from the protection check. This is pretty much standard for the GMA protection scheme. So because 60A is doing a SEI instruction which sets the interrupt bit which basically disables the uh, IRQ interrupts and then it switches into what looks like all RAM mode by setting the processor port register at 01 in hex. It, it's basically decrypting everything, not decrypting, descrambling everything that it's just loaded. A simple EOR is is a descramble, it's, it's nothing too complicated. It then indirectly jumps through uh, 8000 in hex, which is intriguing. It's doing a close all and a clear channel. That's, that's fine, it's just standard reinitialization stuff. It's restoring the default vectors as well from the kernel copy um, at 6C0 in hex. It's restoring it from the kernel at FD30 in hex there and restoring the IRQ vectors and everything else. It's clearing zero the lower zero page, the lower extended zero page anyway. But look, there is a CBM80 marker at 8000. And four in hex there. C3, C2, CD is CBM. Here I'm just updating my debugging notes as I'm going along. And of course I'm going to save and uh, commit this file to source control so you can also see my debugging notes. I will also add a link in the description below to the repository for that. Of course after the CLI which clears the interrupt disable flag which enables the IRQs again. It then goes straight into the kernel IRQ handler and, and that's probably because during this descramble process uh, one or well just a, an interrupt was triggered by something somewhere like a default timer interrupt or something like that and basically it runs the kernel IRQ default kernel level IRQ. Now, this is intriguing. I mean, in a game, once you finish loading it, you really want to guarantee that you have control over all of the memory. You don't really want to have the kernel IRQ coming along and running its thing because it it does a keyboard update loop. It tests the run stop key sometimes, um, depending on what it's set up to be doing, and it suddenly runs the keyboard update loop unless you redefine it to do other things which you know can you know, slightly mess around with zero page or extended zero page so you know to be honest I would not really re-enable interrupts uh, I, I you know technically speaking you would want control over the whole of memory to make sure that your, the memory that you've loaded is not being altered by anything else you don't really want to restore default vectors and then allow the, the kernel level interrupts to run but anyway ho-hum such is life anyway eventually we can see that it gets to wanting to run the entry point at 900 in hex now this looks like it is the um, the game entry point right uh, even though this is the disk version it looks like the game entry point is at 900 in hex I'm not too sure how much memory to save out here. I, I didn't really notice that as, a, as the game was loading or anything else. So we'll just save the whole of memory, including some parts of extended zero page as well. So just after the stack finishes, then the stack is from 100 to 1FF in hex. The next byte along is 200 in hex, which is basically the start of extended zero page, if you like. I'm just going to save all of that up until the end of memory. And then at this point, the game should run because that's just where it is at the point of the disk loader. When the game is running in the mem memory view, I did see an awful lot of write updates to the end of memory, a ton of them. Which is going to be intriguing. I've attached a new image to 
a disk image to the disk. The breakpoints didn't trigger anything in the kernel uh, serial code. So that means that when the game starts, it does not load the score table. Okay. The, the, the high score table was not loaded by the game code when the game code starts. So I'm assuming that it is loaded beforehand. We'll, we'll check that out later on. However, what I really need to do now is that I really need to play uh, the disk version enough to get a high score uh, a high enough score to enter my initials or whatever into the high score table to trigger a save. Okay, so I need to play through the game. I think I need to get at least 10,000 points. So that means I need to play through a few levels. Maybe two or three, depending on how many enemies I destroy and how many bonus things that I collect from the nucleus as it is destroyed. Ow. There we go. Bonus point. I think it's an extra thousand points or something like that. Which is useful. At a later level you get one per orbiting thing that you've destroyed around the nucleus. So I think on later levels you like get two or three or four or five. So actually the later levels you can get quite a lot of bonus points and bonus money. I saw again, you know, the yellow area in the memory view updating an awful lot of data there and I think that end of memory data is basically a whole bunch of sprite frames so we'll see later on what that looks like go. Do, do, do. this is level two I think right so um, I think I need to destroy two of these mm -hmm. The little beacons coming out of the orbiting things are quite useful sometimes if you don't know exactly where they are. Sometimes they drift across your screen and it shows you the direction in which they came from, obviously by the way that they're moving, so then you can follow along their path and then find the orbiting things. There we go. Two bonus things coming from the nucleus. Dink, 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 dink. We go. Oh dear, well, that, that didn't. It doesn't help with the energy situation on my spaceship at all. When I was playing this game, I did notice actually that when a lot of enemies came out of the orbiting things quite quickly, or when the nucleus was firing lots of oh whoops bullets, I did notice that the sprites were flickering quite a lot in the multiplexer, so I wonder what the multiplex is doing. Anyway, I can edit my uh, initials, whatever it's not initials, but you know. And then I entered my entered the details into the high score table. Game over, yes. And now watch the drive light just in case. Ah, look, it's using the default serial code. So there's some disk code using the kernel serial routines. Interesting. So we can see here that it is uh, using, well, oh look, it's, oh well, it's telling drive eight to listen, so it's not using the uh, whichever drive was uh, being used to boot the game with. It's hard coding it to, I think, drive 8. Uh, unless it reads it somewhere else and self modifies that in the code later on. Maybe it does. Uh, let's have a look through the history. It would have to be storing into 12F8. I don't think it. What? Uh, FA, sorry, 12FA to self-modify the load accumulator instruction there at 12F9 in hex. Hmm. Oh look, there we go, drive 8, listen, uh, secondary, da da da, and then it does uh, 4D, 2D. This sets up a memory, m, m dash something command. It is sending the first two characters. 
So yes, this sets up M dash E in the serial connection to the drive. And then we'll just hop over all of this kernel stuff until we get to here. There we go. Now, where does it come back to? It comes back to, well, there we go. I'm just setting up a, la a label so that when I'm reading through this code later on, it's easier to remember what it is doing. So 5.7 in hex is w, so this is sending an m-w command, which is memory write. Uh, in the C64's memory, 130e and 130f look like they contain the low and high address of the buffer to use in the 1541 drives RAM, which is at 500 in hex, we can see that being set up at 1240 and a, and a little bit of code before that as well was loading X and Y registers with appropriate load and high values. It's then say, saying that it's, it's going to send $20 bytes, which is 32 bytes in decimal, and it's doing that at 125A. So the high score saving routine just basically does a memory write. Uh, it is then doing a raster beam check. It is then at 126E. It is then uh, sending a memory execute command with uh, the memory execute address of 500 in hex, and that's doing that at 1288. It is then uh, doing an unlisten. It is then restoring the uh, processor port. Mm -hmm. Oh look, it's turning off the sprites at 122A to 122C there. It's loading accumulated with zero and storing it as well. Okay. So yeah, basically this is setting up a whole bunch of... It, it, it seems to be sending a whole bunch of code plus I'm guessing the high score data all in one chunk and then it is telling it to execute that code on the drive at 500. Uh, D030 I think is the uh, the clock speed yeah the clock speed uh, to be used and that's the C128 version where this higher speed CPU is enabled during the border just to make sure I think I think that's what it's doing it's disabling the the higher speed CPU for the I.O. writes, uh, to be honest. That should be disabled anyway, I think, uh, because the screen is enabled anyway, so... <laughs> On the C64, uh, that doesn't do anything at all, I don't think. It's one of those extra little registers which is, is a minor incompatibility that if games are updating it mistakenly, thinking it didn't do anything on the Commodore 64 and either it is a bug or if it was deliberate, doesn't really matter. On the C128, it caused something to happen. So I think on the Commodore 64, if you are accidentally setting a bit in that register and then running your incompatible code on C128, then, then C128, well actually the C128 is incompatible. Right? It, it's not Commodore 64's fault that you're storing bits in registers that don't do anything on the Commodore 64. Hmm. Yeah, look. So on the Commodore, the code that was being sent to this uh, 1541, we can see it's doing a D042JSR. Uh, it is copying memory from the code data that has been sent to 700 in yeah, okay. So yeah, the drive code, when it runs, looks like it just tells the drive to, to write what is in buffer 700 to the specific, specific track in the sector which stores the high score table. <laughs> so it's just writing the block, basically, which is a good way of doing it. Let's remove the breakpoint at the end of the setup disk m dash uh, subroutine. And let's continue executing on uh, until 
we complete uh, the drive memory write this is the memory execute here because we know that dollar four five in hex is equivalent to e the character e the letter e that's being sent to the drive so we know now that the drive look is starting to execute the code at 500 so we can see here on the drive code look we can see at 50e in the drive code it's loading the accumulator with two storing it with e storing it to e and e and f are the track and sectors for a particular job so I'm looking at the Commodore 64's memory at 7AA9 and wondering why it looks like it's got a SIS2061 basic program there. Basically, it looks like it's running the, the, the GM, oh, so it's, it's the protection code and it's floating around in memory at the wrong memory address. Okay. Anyway, we can see that in the, in the drives memory, it has the, oh, user designed directory by Gu Starnberg. 0531 forward slash 74756 uh, Noist C64 software Noia Noist anyway C64 software looks like somebody's taking credit for the user design directory but the protection is uh, GMA88 which is by Graham Ashton and I did a whole video about this kind of scheme and the fast loader using it in the previous video but basically this this score table write is executing this code which just uses the standard job code ROM interface which is as part of the the standard 1541 ROM interface for reading and writing sectors and executing ex executing them reading and writing blocks of which tracks and sectors are obviously those blocks uh, D042 is uh, loading the block allocation map hmm. which uh, I'm not entirely sure that you need to do that when you're using the job interface to write raw blocks of data but okay uh, turning the LED on is C11A turning the LED on in the rock uh, in the 1541 ROM functions anyway it, it turns the LED on but it also enables the interrupts by doing a CLI instruction so that you know, look uh, the, the previous video goes into more detail but basically turning on the interrupts allows the job processing the interrupt to run on the drive and uh, it will pick up the job request to read or write or execute a particular track and sector, a particular block, basically. So it's copying data from 52A up to um, 700 in the in drives memory, and, and that's the buffer which is used by that particular job. And the job slot is at hex 04, which is stored into a hex 51B in the drive code there, highlighted in red. We can see here on the 1541 job codes that job slot 4 uses buffer 700, which we can see quite clearly there. And it uses uh, location E and F for track and sector, and we can see it uses buffer 700. So, not a problem. So it returns from the code once it's executed. However, we can see that there is there seems to be some code there which waits for the job to complete before returning with success. I wonder if the game code was going to call that later on. I don't think I noticed that the game code was calling that that completion routine. I think once the game says write this data to disk, I think the game just goes off and runs its title screen, right? So I have a feeling that the drive is running this code in parallel, obviously, with the game code running on the C64. Quite a nice way of doing it though. Uh, you send a whole bunch of code plus its data and then just tell it to execute it. I don't know why a block write wasn't used instead though. Then you don't need to run any code on the drive at all. But okay. So that is the end of the score table write for track 2 sector 1. 
and it uses the job code at 0, 4 in hex, which is the same as 4. So if I exit out now, well, okay, so this job code, so if I exit, we're at that breakpoint there, which is at the end of the save routine, it then goes back to the game, and look in the emulator for the drive light, switching on and off, and also look at what the uh, track indicator shows, which is the bottom right hand corner of the emulation window. The drive here indicates that, well the drive is just about to execute, well it has been executing the code, sorry, it's just about to store into the job code at $0.04, so it's just about to store job code uh, hex 90, which is at 519 and 51B in hex in the drive's memory there in the disassembly that you can see where the breakpoint is. The game is already displaying the animation for the title screen. Now, uh, the nucleus is showing its little orbital pattern and it's got the stars coming out of the central nucleus area, so on and so forth. So, the drive is now executing the write as the title screen is going, as you would kind of normally expect. So let's have a little look at the tape loader now, and when the tape header, or when the tape buffer has been filled with the file name and all of this extra information which is usually included in the tape header, we can see that it is uh, set up to start loading at uh, 02A7 in hex, and finish loading at uh, 334 in hex. We're going to put a breakpoint just to cover the whole range of memory that could possibly really get loaded. To verify the tape, I'm going to use my tape tool to analyze the tape file, just to see what it really does. I added a whole bunch of extra code in my tape tool to analyze tape files. Oh, whoops, I forgot the command line options. I need an R there. There we go. So the tape tool is telling me it will probably attempt auto start basic line input output vector via input output vector at 302, the code at 2A7. Which is kind of like a standard loader, really. Um, it will early out as well, it says, due to IRQ high address match. Which is cool. Um, it means that this loader doesn't actually verify the data it's loaded. The, the tape stores data in two parts. The part which is loaded and then the part of data which does the verification with the data that's been loaded into memory. Because it early outs, it doesn't do the verification pass. It means that control is actually passed to the code which is loaded a lot quicker. Just quickly, I'm going back to the disk version to save the RAM memory that was loaded for the disk when it reached 900 in hex. I just remembered that I forgot to switch it to bank RAM when I was doing a save. And I should really do that because I don't want to save the IO address space, I want to save the RAM underneath the IO address space. I'm doing this because I want to compare the code and data between the disk and tape version later on. I want to see if there's any differences. So now I've got the RAM underneath the I.O. space saved out from the disk version. Let's go and do the same now for the tape. So re-familiarizing myself with the output from the tape tool, it will execute the code at 2A7. We'll see if the tape tool is correct with its analysis as the tape file because we've got a breakpoint set for a very large range in memory, relatively speaking, large range anyway. So let's see what we get. And yes, the emulator confirms the analysis from the tape tool that we have code which executes at 287. If we have a look at the CPU history, it has jumped through the vector at 302 in hex from the kernel, from the basic ROM actually, A48 
zero is in the basic room. So the kernel returns from its interrupt. The basic comes along and then tries to execute its vector at 302 easy. Anyway, so the tape code then starts running. I'm just putting a breakpoint in the disk just to test to make sure that the tape code doesn't run into disk code, but I don't think it does. So we can quite quite see here some standard semi-obfuscated tape code here. It seems to be setting up uh, IRQ timers and also NMI timers. Now IRQs are interrupts and NMIs are non-maskable interrupts. Non-maskable interrupts will trigger even if interrupts have been disabled at the IRQ level. The 6502 has these two, two basically in this case, uh, interrupts levels, IRQ and NMI. NMI stands for non-maskable interrupt, in other words, an interrupt that cannot be masked, cannot be stopped by the interrupt flag in the processor counter. Process status, actually, sorry. Processor counter, program counter is different, obviously. So the jump to FCE2 is going to be a reset. This is kind of usual thing, right? The, the, the loader will jump straight to the reset routine if it finds out anything is wrong. Like, for example, the load A with $C1 and compare with $C2 and branch on the equal to 2E2. 2E2 is jump to FCE2, which is reset. <laughs> um, so we have some timer values. The timer value, I think, for the IRQ is going to be a timer value for the speed of the tape pulses. And the IRQ is going to be set up to trigger, I think, on... Uh, a pulse from the tape and then it's going to look at whether or not the timer has underflowed in other words the timer has finished counting down and that will tell the code whether or not it is a long pulse or a short pulse usually these fast loaders use uh, two pulse lengths not always some use three or four pulse lengths but I think in this case it's probably going to be using two pulse lengths, a long and a short. So the kernel, uh, non-maskable interrupt vector is being set to 3D5, also on the timer, I think. This branch are not equal to 2FE probably always executes, because look, the load accumulator is there. Unless the branch are not equal is self-modified to somewhere else, which it could be later on. I think it's always going to be branching not, e not equaling to itself. Basically branching on always because the accumulator, the program, the, pr the accumulator is not equal because it's not equal to zero and the processor status should never really change regardless of how the interrupts of, uh, are exiting. So we should, that should just be a, an infinite branch. The uh, interrupt comes along either on the top, probably on the tape pulse, the NMI is at 3D5, but this is an IRQ. We can see it reads the timer high value and then it restarts the timer control using the Y register immediately afterwards of reading the timer high value. It does an EOR and a couple of shifts and then it does a rotate left. A9 has probably been set up, I think, to have a high bit or to have a low bit which then gets shifted into the high bit and then after eight shifts that bit will come out and trigger the branch on carry set which goes to 375 either sorry the branch on carry clear goes to 368 which does a compare so on carry set in other words it's probably been cleared it's probably been all set to ones then looking at this and then the code every eight bits you would hope uh, it does a compare with the control characters, it's, it, it, with the control value it's expecting to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then depending on the bytes, the control bytes and the byte data values which come from the tape, it's then storing that into memory. 
and also using that as a checksum. Oh look, the NMI seems to have been running actually. Interesting. 3D5, look, the NMI, 3D5 CLI. In this instance, has the non-maskable interrupt come along and basically said, hey, I want to run some code and not... Okay, so the branch not equal is infinite, but then it the, the NMI comes along once <laughs> and then starts running uh, a whole bunch of extra code. Oh, uh, look. 2d5, 2d6, storing e00 in there, and then brunt, jumping to 2a7. Hmm. Oh, look. 3e5 loads with 0, 02, and then it stores it in the border color, and then it does a branch on equal to 3e0. So this looks like it's reading the load complete uh, value, if you like, from $02 in memory it's a flag which says the loading is complete. If the loading hasn't completed, it jumps around, it branches back. But if it's completed, it JSRs to 2D7. 2D7, if I remember rightly, sets up the IRQ timers again. Hmm. Okay. But it's changing the what looks like the load address, this time uh, at the code at 3EF, look. So it's a, it's kind of nicely obfuscated, actually. This tape loader jumps around in itself, self-modifies itself, changes the execution flow using what looks like a timed and non-maskable interrupt, which tries its hardest not to interrupt the IRQ. In other words, it clears the interrupt flag quite quickly. Huh. Interesting way of doing it kind of obfuscates your code flow a bit. Mm -hmm. And it continues loading. Okay. Well, nice way of doing it. I think in one of my older tape loaders, I used to have a non-maskable interrupt that used to come along and finish the execution like this. But the main part of the code would start self-clearing itself, self-destructing basically, and the non-maskable interrupt was timed to come along before the self-destruction code would delete itself. And this helped to obfuscate what the loader was doing, but it would also self it would also clear itself from memory, which was also quite a cool way of obfuscating its execution. Technically it meant that if you tried to freeze the C64 to try and debug what it was doing, then the non-maskable interrupt would trigger at a different time unless you had something which would freeze the state of the CIA. The CIAs are responsible for having the counters which trigger these IRQs or the NMI interrupts. So as is quite usual in these cases, the tape loader does checks with expected bytes, uh, control bytes. It will usually have uh, a checksum. It will usually have a low and high address that it will, should start to load to. We can see the final store at 3A6 already. It's an indirected store with Y. That's like a dead giveaway. Almost certainly is using that to store the loaded data into memory. The store to C1 with 0 at 38D in hex that you can see in the disassembly there is it's zeroing the, uh, it looks like it's doing a, a checksum with a simple EOR into C1 and then storing back again. So yeah, this is almost certainly the store byte, loaded byte of data into memory, and then followed by the checksum calculation. And of course you want to zero out your checksum before you start loading the data, right? So just adding some debugging notes now into my text file, just so I don't forget later on, of information that is discovered from this. I think there is quite a lot of self-modifying state code in here. I think that helps keep it small, but it also helps to obfuscate exactly what it is doing. Yes, yeah, so going back to 3D5 is where it, it kicks off the loading routine again, you see. So I think this jump here starts perhaps the next bunch of loaded code. I have a feeling. We'll see. Although, ah, uh, look, it's probably what's just self-modified it, right? Yeah, 
it self-modified the jump which was at 200 now it's at E000 and that was at 2D4 in hex cool okay so it's a, it's loading a whole bunch of stuff and then it's well actually it's uh, reinitializing the uh, load it's reinitializing the load IRQ and it was actually resetting the, the kernel IRQ vector. Okay, cool. And we can see that there's code loaded at E000, which is underneath the kernel, because now the kernel has been switched off. The kernel has been switched off all the way through this load, actually. Once it started executing the code with the, within the uh, tape header. And the data that was loaded at E000 onwards was the bitmap screen and the update code I think we're looking at it for the Morpheus loading screen for the tape loading screen the one that animates not not the disk loader so I think if we look into this code here it will just be the animating tape loader right it doesn't look like it's going to be anything unexpected so we have a whole bunch of breakpoints in this code which has been loaded into extended zero page memory for the tape turbo loader. We have a whole bunch of code and graphics data for the loading screen which animates at E000. There's nothing else really loaded at this point in time. But I'm setting this up here because we should expect to see the first bank start loading game-related data. Right? If I let this run now, and also I'm putting a breakpoint at 900 in hex so that if the game code starts or tries to start, we'll break on it. Now this is interesting. The code, the turbo tape loading code, which was loaded into extended zero page memory as part of this uh, boot process if you like or the auto run process is being repurposed and reused to load the main game code with the animated title screen data which is cool and we can see here that it's just reusing all of that code now it was interesting to note that the graphics data obviously was updating the animated bitmap during the loading phase now of course the the graphics memory which is just a RAM all the way up at high memory uh, seems to include a whole bunch of quite heavily compressed data actually and there seem to be a few passes through memory of decompression now the tape version seems to be compressed a little bit more than the disk to be honest if you know which is kind of cool it, it reduces the loading time I think quite considerably I could see in the memory view that there are several passes and if you rewind the video and have a look you'll see the, the several the several passes through memory of doing different compression stages or decompression stages as it, as it is and it's going through and doing a whole bunch of passes you can see what looks like a uh, an LZ based decompression the the RAM update pattern for that kind of decompression method is quite obvious to look at it does copies from different places as it is reusing uh, already decompressed data and reusing already de already decompressed patterns to copy them to somewhere else it, it's more efficient in terms of compression size to do that anyway now it's at 900 which is the same entry point as the uh, disk version so let's save all of that memory that we loaded with uh, the tape loader as well so we can compare it later on now i think the memory there that's at the, at the end of memory is, is is left over compressed data i don't think it was decompressing full amount of memory to be honest but that's okay just saving the whole memory is just the easiest way but i think we have some extraneous data yeah. data that's not really needed and uh, I did notice that when the game started it seemed to do an update of, of a lot of different data at the end of memory. We'll look into that later on I think. 
So we have some sprites at in this second bank here. Those are the uncompressed sprites. We can see that it's probably going to copy those. That looks like compressed sprite data in the next bank after that, but we'll look into that later on. The character set data, well there seems to be some character set data at the end of this bank as well. It's the third bank. We are looking for the text of the video, the screen bank basically, and there we go, there's the screen bank. And we have uh, one character set for the large uh, font. So the large part, the, la the part of the screen which has the large font is a different part of the, has a, uses, uses a different character set compared to the game screen, which is the score panel and the large spaceship. Okay, that's fine. So we have two character sets up there. Oh, so those those uh, uncompressed sprites that are in the second bank at 400 onwards, we can see that they just sit there in memory. But they're probably being copied from. Uh, the first row of sprites looks like the directional fire sprites when the spaceship fires, it uses its directional fire weapons, which I don't have installed right now. There's a little gun muzzle flash effect. And the second row of sprites there seems to be the sprites which are used during the title screen and also the ship editing portion of the game. So you can choose where you install your various upgrades. And there's a little cursor arrow thing, like a little Maris pointer, and it looks like we've got a Maris pointer. So I've destroyed the nucleus for the first level. That's interesting, when the parallax uh, grid effect comes in there's a whole bunch of extra characters calculated in the last bank. You can see them there at C000, there's a whole large block of characters there. And it obviously does that because it wanted to calculate. Now what I'm doing here is that I'm using the tool in ICU to look for changed values in memory. So every time now I buy a system, I'm looking for values that change in memory. So I buy something, blink, hit the changed button, and it looks for addresses in memory that have changed. Now, this one, uh, 26 and probably 27, but 26 especially seems to be some kind of like frame counter or something. Uh, I think we can ignore that. 272 looks interesting and C063 also looks interesting. So my current gold or in-game currency if you like is at 452. I think looking at this it's probably going to be 272. We'll see. So if I purchase another one, another viewport, the viewport is the cheapest one at 200 so I can afford to do. There we go, you see it's it's changed, 272 has now changed to be 2, which is the number of, uh, it, it's the hundreds unit column, if you like. Uh, so the hundreds column is going to be 2. There we go, and now it's 0. Ooh, okay. So 272 looks like it's the amount of money you have. Now I'm using my unchanged button. Because I've not done a purchase, these values should be unchanged and it's narrowed it down again to these two places in memory. Basically, I want to get myself some more money and ICU having this memory scan tool makes it relatively easy to look for uh, things like lives and stuff like that. You don't have to do the narrowing down yourself. So I'm going to go back into the game now. I'm going to 
I think I'm going to try and earn some extra money. Well, I will earn some extra money because uh, I'm playing the game. And if you kill enemies, destroy them. Uh, I don't want to say the kill word in, on YouTube. Oops, sorry, YouTube. But don't censor me just because I said a word in terms of game gameplay for a computer game. It's not real life. <sighs> anyway, uh, yes, so <laughs> uh, earning money by doing these things to the computer game characters. There we go. There's one, and then the next one. Blah, blah, blah. Here we go. Those ones do look very nice when they when they come out from the little orbital thing, right? Or the thing of orbiting the nucleus. Bling. I'm gonna hurt my ship too much if I'm not careful. Let's not do that, huh? Hello, nucleus. Okay, there we go. Give me tons of extra points. Thank you. And then dematerialize back again. So let's commission a system. Hello. Uh, viewport again? Yes, okay, there we go. Change. Hmm, look. 5-1. 5,172 gold or whatever it is. Oh, look, it's 5-1. Now it's 4-9. Yeah, I think this is definitely... Yeah, I think this is definitely, I think 272 is definitely the one which stores the amount of money you have. And I think looking at this is in binary coded decimal. Now, binary coded decimal is where each half of the hex number, the digits from 0 to 9, represent the decimal digits 0 to 9. So C063 doesn't look that interesting for me, to be honest. Uh, of course, C069 is actually the displayed screen. Uh, so it's, it's re reflecting the displayed information that is in the character screen. That's not interesting to me. I think the information is coming from 270, probably two, you know, 272 specifically. Yeah, so, so the, the character screen for the, for the game display for the score panel is not, probably not going to be the golden source of data for the amount of money you have, I definitely think is uh, 272. Right, I think I think there's definitely going to be a calculation routine which converts the binary code of decimal into characters to display on the screen, for example. So let's just test this hypothesis, shall we? Uh, I'm hoping that, th that the game code which calculates what money to display on the screen runs all the time of course you know if it was optimized it would only run when you click on something to buy or do some kind of transaction for your ship right but you know I'm hoping it's running all the time yeah it's definitely definitely the, the memory address for that definitely matches up so it's definitely not C C6 C062 yeah I definitely think it's only used for display so, let's go back and look at 272, or probably more likely 270. So, the only way that we can retest this is to put a value into, say, 271, I think. We'll put 2. That should be 24,772. Right? Oh, and look, there we go. Straight away. Yay. Thank you very much for, yeah, money. Definitely woohoo money. Uh, this is why, you know, uh, modern tools like ICU and stuff like that are very, very useful. It takes a lot of the... Okay, it takes away some of the skill, but it takes away a lot of the drudge work, the toil, if you like, of hunting through memory and noting down the values of things. That it, it just does all the work for you. It's great. I wonder what the largest number is that the game can represent. I have a very large spaceship now. I'm buying a whole bunch of extra weapons and 
components to install on, on my spaceship. But none are available right now to install because I've just purchased them. So let's have a look at the differences between the disc and the tape versions. I can see here, oh look, there's similarities in terms of the opcodes, but again the addresses between the code chunks are different. There's, there's large chunks of code which are the same, but in different memory locations. So it looks like the disk and the tape versions were assembled from roughly the same code, but they have different chunks of code included. So probably one includes the code to save to disk and the other one just basically doesn't. What looks like compressed graphics data uh, doesn't look like there's any difference. And at the end of memory, we're not really interested because the end of memory at the point of starting the game is the different memory in the loading screen and or any memory that was left during the decompression of the tape version. So the game code is not the same. So it means that actually perhaps cheat codes that would have worked on tape wouldn't have worked on disk and vice versa. Apart from this, this location 272 down in the extended zero page in hex that gives you the money, which is this one here, would probably still work uh, if you had like a, a poke for a, for a hacker cartridge or something like that to give you extra money, then that poke in inverted commas would probably still work. The data that's down in lower zero page memory or extended zero page memory usually doesn't change between disk and tape versions. Not always the case, but, but usually the case. So on the disk version in the C64's memory, we have what looks like a multiplexer sprite update routine. So roughly 400 in hex onwards. Looks like it's getting an index, looks like it's getting values for sprite position and then storing, storing them into the VIC sprite registers the usual kind of stuff that you would normally expect to see from sprite multiplexers or basically an animation routine that updates sprite frames and colors and positions. So these are the sprites that are in the last bank which is the currently displayed game screen. We can see that actually there's quite a lot of sprite frames. Quite a rich set of animation frames there. The first row of sprites, of course, is the two, well, at least one screen being updated, not two. There's probably some uh, animated stars, perhaps. No, it's just the game screen. Sorry. So it's the first kilobyte. One 40 by 25 character screen is, is basically a kilobyte. Minus a few bytes. But then the bytes at the end of the, the kilobyte are actually used for the sprite pointers. So these sprites here, you can see that they've swapped over. So they swap over from the decompressed or uncompressed sprite frames in the second bank. So when it's in the title screen, we get the sprite frames for the animation and the menu. If you notice this, the second row of sprites, if I go back to the game, then they will swap back again. So let's start the game, enter the level, and you'll notice that they get copied over. Also watch out for the character set, the character set data that gets updated as well for the parallax effect. So there's a few things to watch out for here, but thankfully you can just rewind and then run the video. So there's the calculated dynamic characters that get copied over for the parallax effect. And then the sprites get refreshed after the game really starts and the parallax effect fades out. And we can see that we've got the directional gun, the fire, muzzle flashes copied in now. 
instead of the, the arrow mouse pointers and stuff like that. So if we go back to the title screen, you'll notice that the sprites for the title screen animations get refreshed as well. So notice that the second row of sprites, they get copied over with the muscle flashes. So actually there's quite a lot of dynamic sprites here. The title screen also uses one screen bank, it doesn't seem to use two screen banks. This game unusually only has one screen, it doesn't have often, it doesn't have off screen and displayed screen banks, it just has one screen bank. Which is, you know, unusual for this type of game, usually there would be two, but okay that's fine. I mean it doesn't need to scroll the whole screen, it's just scrolling the, the parallax stars effect, so it does less. Because as we can see, the ship is made out of characters. Not really sprites. I mean there are animated sprites in some areas, but some of the animations are just characters as well. So, so at this point I want to use my compression tool to compress both of the files that were saved from the disk and the tape version. I know that they have a whole bunch of extra data which isn't needed, but we can at least do a test compression to see if those data files uh, still work. So you might have noticed the typo, I forgot to put a dollar for the start address, so let's just use a dollar for the start address on the disk and the tape memory that was saved out, even with the extraneous data. We can see actually that the uh, tape version compresses to a smaller size compared to the disc version, which is relatively interesting. I think a better option would be to extract the file directly from the disc for the game and then just compress that memory range. I think we'll do that later on. But here I'm just double checking that the disc and the tape version, the whole bunch of memory that was saved that results in the game working, and it does. So there we go. So let's see if we can find the, I think the files now on the disk version. See if we can extract them and then see how large uh, the game file is when it's compressed using the same compression tool. This is just basically doing a very, very quick reverse engineering and debugging of the disk loader. So we already know that it's GMA88 protected, we kind of know that it runs a whole bunch of drive code. We know its mechanism of executing drive code is by executing code at, say for example, 3B6 and using the job code E0, which is execute, where it does a seek and then it seeks the head to that particular track and then it runs the code which is in the buffer at 300 in hex in the drive memory and then it will use a sync mark and then header check to make sure it's getting the right block within the track, the right sector, sorry, within the, within the track. So that's what this mechanism does, and it's a fairly standard way of doing it for this protection scheme, for this disk loader particularly. We can see it sets up the, the, the buffer high address pointer in 3.1, for example. It does a find for the start of the data block, for example, or defines the start of the data block. It waits for the operation to complete with the branch on overflow clear to 307, so back to itself again. And, and as we know from the previous video, the drive hardware will set the overflow flag, which is why we have the clear overflow directly after it. It then reads bytes from 
the disk head. Right, so it, it looks at the start of the data block, gets gets bytes from the disk head, then it decodes those bytes. It, it looks for the intended data in the track header, or, or the the block header, sorry, and then continues decoding it. It does a JSR to 302, which does that two-bit protocol transfer. In the bit with 1800, BPL, load accumulator, store it in 1800. All of this is the two-bit protocol drive transfer code, which I go into more detail in the other video about this fast loader. As I say, I'm going to put a link in the description below to that video. We don't need to go into too much detail about that. What we're really interested in is on the Commodore 64 side of the code, to be honest. And the Commodore 64 side of the code is interesting for us in this particular video because we want to try and find out where it is loading or getting bytes from the disk and then storing those bytes to memory during the load process. I am at this point wondering when track 2 sector 1 is read for the high score table. And we'll get to that later on. Here in the drive code at 33C we can see that it loads the sector number from 601 and stores it into 07 in preparation for getting the next block. So we know practically with a good degree of certainty that the blocks are arranged on the disk in basically standard DOS format. In other words each block has a pointer to the next track and sector of the block and if the track is zero then it is it contains the remaining number of bytes for that block within the sector byte. So to find where the Commodore 64 code receives the information from the disk all that we really need to do is put a breakpoint in the drive code where it's starting to send the 2-bit protocol back. If it's in a standard DOS format however all we need to do really is to have a breakpoint at the start of the drive code where it's reading the first block and then to note down those track and sectors and then use the, a tool to read the information from the disk and then save the files. Luckily enough my tweaked C1541 utility has the ability to save out a whole chain of blocks as a file. The current block track and sector that's been read is in 6 and 7 in the drive memory, which is 1101 in hex. And we can see that track and sector block 1101 then points to 110B. So we can use the chain write command to write this chain of blocks to a file, and we can see that the first two bytes of this file are the low and high bytes of the load address and then the rest of the file bytes are saved out. So actually we don't even need to look at the Commodore 64 side of the code. We only really need to look at the drive side of code and we just need to trap the start of the load for each file that the Commodore 64 requests from the drive. And then we can just chain write those tracks and sectors to individual files. This way we get the data straight from the drive, straight from the disk image. We, we don't get it after the Commodore 64 has tried to store it into memory, which is more efficient basically. More accurate as well, I think, as long as the blocks are stored on the drive in this format. To be honest, if I was making a new disk today, I would not follow the standard DOS format of linking the blocks together like this. It makes it too easy to reverse engineer. It obviously makes it easier to create the disk and to maintain the disk, because all you would need to do is just do a, a a standard DOS write of all of your files and then just replace the directory. And of course remember where all the files started 
and remember the block and set the track and sector. But there are more obfuscated ways of doing this. I think we can see here that actually at this point the Commodore 64 has requested that the drive does a protection track check. Uh, reading track, what was it, 38 or 26 in hex, 38 in decimal. We can see this from the last track and sector from the job code that was sent over. We are not interested in obviously trying to save the data from the protection track. We just want to save the the slightly DOS formatted files, even if they don't have the directory entry, we just want to save those blockchains. I think this is the next file. Seems to be a decent number of blocks. This one, I think this is probably the loading screen. Yeah, look, the loading screen data again starts at E0. And none of these tracks and sectors seem to be the high score table save track and sector of two and one so none of these blocks loaded seem to be loading the the high score entry table so let's go for the next file now the code of 373 is where it sends the end of file control code i think it sends a one followed by a two and that sends to the drive a sense of the Commodore 64 signaling that the end of the file has been reached and at this point when it's trying to load the game data we can see that the track and sector is 1102 in the memory address for the drive at address 6 and 7 so we use that to write the whole blockchain out and we can see that the low and high bytes are FC and 08, which means that the start loading address is 8FC in hex on the Commodore 64. That's a better result, yes. We know that this file is scrambled with the EOR code that we found earlier on. There's just one more file, isn't there, that we need to check. Actually, the block, which is a track and sector 2, 1, track 2, block 1 sector one sorry we need to find out when that's loaded looking at the blockchain for the game data that was just saved out into the morpheus 3 pig file none of those seem to read track two sector one so we really are still looking for the final piece of data for the score table read it might happen in the game code, it might happen at the end of the load. We'll see. We now have a breakpoint on the drive code, of course, that we need. End of end of the game file for the for the sector. So it's loading the game data, which is a very long blockchain, of course, as you would normally expect. A chain of blocks not blockchain as in a cryptocurrency. Gosh, no, definitely not. Okay, so this is the last track and sector. Then we'll have a look for a store now into... Okay, we'll ignore those because that's the job code being updated in the drives ROM code. We're not interested in that. What we are interested in is the last, hopefully last file data now being loaded. I'm just going to put the breakpoint on the Commodore 64 side so that if it hits the game start, then we know that it's started hitting the game code. And there we go. Aha, uh -huh. so it just starts loading uh, the data from track 2, sector 1 during the game load. It just does one last file load. Okay. There we are. It does read the score table here. So, there we go. That's the last file. And if we have a look at that file, 
which is this one here. We can see it's just one block long. And it actually loads at 8.0.0 in hex, which is at the start of basic memory just after the default screen. So this block does not overwrite the block of data that's loaded for the game. Now, the game started loading its data at 8FC in hex, I think it was, if, if I remember correctly. So this one finishes loading its high school table data just before the game code. Here we've just hit the breakpoint, which is at the PLA, which does for the pull accumulator of the descramble code, and before it transfers it to X, before it JSRs at 60A into the descramble code itself, and we now know that the descramble EOR code is C6. Just verifying that from the Commodore 64 code. So we know what the E or D scramble code is. We know that it, that it is dollar or hex C6. We can use the file tools in WinHex to do an XOR of the file with C6. And then we put back the start, the correct start address because we didn't really want to XOR the uh, start address as well. So we'll save that file as a descramble file. Now, if we just load the descramble file, just, you know, go 900. Well, there you go. Uh, so that's the descramble file, just pulled directly from the disk image and, and it works. The only thing that won't be correct is, of course, the score table has blank entries, or, but, or rather entries that is, is whatever, <laughs> see, F, 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 F. Um, yeah, the names are wrong, obviously, and the scores are wrong, and that's because the score table wasn't loaded before the game code. So it doesn't really matter because the two pieces of memory don't overlap, so we can load them actually in any order. I need to load the right files of course. I really can't type at the moment. There we are. Oh no, the score table. So game data, then the score table, descrambled game data, and the score table just go 900, and then ta -da. And if we have a look at the score table entries now, they contain the default values as you would normally expect. And the game seems to work. And of course this means that the protection on the disk version was circumvented as well. So if we have, since we have loaded the descrambled game data and the score table together, we now know which memory range we should use to just save that data that was pulled from the disk. So we know it starts at 800 and we know that it should finish at C50, uh, CE01, uh, sorry, so I'll just set the end address to be CE02 just you know, for safety's sake, safety purposes. And then we can use uh, my compression tool to compress this file into a, 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 a self running file. There we go. The correct start address in hex, of course. Oh, we want the output the file first. There we go. And, and then the start address in hex, please. Thank you. And there we go. And now we now have a nice small file. Look, 6C1B 
bytes long, including all of the uh, self-extracting code. Of course, I still can't type again. And there we go. There's the full disk version, compressed as a nice small single file. So going back to that nice single compressed file now, and looking at the sprites and the character sets, we're looking now at the technical details of the graphics again now in the game now that we have a nice single compressed file that runs nice and quickly in the emulator. This data at the end of the character set of course is just compressed data from the, the self-extracting executable that was just created. So we're not really interested in that. It's not game data, definitely not game data at all. It's compressed game data. Now this is interesting. We know that the game has a lot of sprites in this last bank. So where are the sprites? And this is where I think that we need to really appreciate how the game actually has copies of these sprites and it refreshes the sprites as the game is actually running between the title screen and the, uh, well, the attract mode and there we go, you see, all of these sprites were created from data somewhere. Now, when I was looking through the memory earlier on, I didn't see that many sprites. So, it looks like, and look, the uh, disk version has the uh, CBM80 marker as well in the reset vector. But yeah, these, these sprites must get stored or restored from somewhere. Uh, I'm really intrigued about what happens during a reset, by the way. So, because during the game, of course, it's not running, but you'll notice that here's, here's a whole bunch of pre calculated graph data, and then if you quit and go back to the title screen, it's restored the sprites again. Now, the sprites that get restored when it goes back to the title screen or the attract mode are sometimes subtly different. It seems to restore different sprite frames, or, or the look and feel of the sprites, the, the design of the, of the sprites seems to subtly change, which I think is great. It means that the title screen is, is not static, it means it's dynamic. Now, if we have a look here, we can obviously see here what is compressed sprite data. It's using uh, some, uh, it's not a very it's not a very rigorous compression routine because it has to be quite quick to decompress, but it is somewhat compressed. Obviously it is not fully compressed, but we can see fragments of sprites which look somewhat sensible, you know, but we know now that the game is restoring the sprites, not only from those uncompressed sprite frames, but it's restoring them from compressed sprite frames elsewhere in memory as well, which I think is fantastic. So, uh, I don't know if you remember, but when I was looking at Last Ninja, Last Ninja also decompresses sprites somewhat. But the compression for these sprites seems to be a little bit better than the Last Ninja compression for those sprite frames. Anyway, so when the reset vector runs, we can see it's running this code here, and this code here seems to be doing uh, this is a warm reset, obviously. The kind of reset that you would get by connecting pins 1 and 3 on the user port, for example, or pressing the reset button on a cartridge, if you've got it plugged in. So this warm reset code seems to uh, do all sorts of things, like setting the clock speed back to default if you're using a Commodore 128. Uh, it seems to be clearing memory. It does a memory clear pass, and then it jumps to the reset routine, we can see that it's cleared most of the memory with the exception of the sprites that's underneath the IO space and the color ramp. Interesting, huh? <clears throat> it hasn't cleared the last four sprites either, but it's cleared the rest of the data in memory. So everything else is clear.
So the game basically does a self-destruct if you try and use a reset. <laughs> and then it calls the proper reset routine, which then goes and, and does, you know, a non-destructive memory check. <clears throat> and there we go. Funny. So the game had a little bit of extra code which tried to stop you from inspecting it, I guess. I think it was quite a cute thing to, to note down in this video. So I think we'll leave the video there. There's more than enough information in this video and it needs to get edited down to a smaller size or a shorter length. So thank you very much for watching up until this point. If you like this kind of stuff on my channel, then please do consider liking or subscribing. And there are buttons for those distinct purposes below the video or somewhere like that. So thank you, take care, have a great day wherever you are.